I want to continue our study back over the Old Testament, and we're in the patriarchal age. And tonight we move to the personage of Abraham. And we'll follow the same approach in the study of Abraham that we did with Adam. It probably will run a little longer. Uh, again, we don't pretend in the study of Adam or Abraham, either one, to hit everything that one might see in the life of Abraham. But we hope to hit those things that uh, are very important, especially when it comes to the matter of Abraham being chosen the New Testament to be the father of the faithful. And of course, we're talking about thousands of years ago now. Uh, our texts are going to be starting out with Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. And then we'll go over to the New Testament in Acts chapter 7, verses 2 through 5. Acts 7, verses 2 through 5. So back to Genesis 12, the divine record tells us, of course, Moses is inspired to write this. Now, the Lord that uh, had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now to Acts 7, 2 through 5, this is Stephen's sermon. He says to the Jews of that day, brethren and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy land and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from thence, when his father was dead, God removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. And he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. And he promised that he would give it to him in possession and to his seed after him, but as yet he had no child. This introduces to us uh, the man Abraham, at this point known as Abram, and in these readings, we want to point out particular things. First of all, God deliberately appeared to Abram. And this was while he was in the land between the rivers, for so the word Mesopotamia means, Tigris and Euphrates rivers, down to where they converge. That was Ur of the Chaldees. And in appearing to Abraham, he had instructions for him. He was to leave the land of his nativity. He was to leave all of his kindred. And he was to go where God would uh, take him. We pause here again and remind ourselves, God said, go, I'll tell you where to go later. This again, evidencing faith that he had in God. One thing, uh, while I'm paused here, that I want to emphasize, when you read through the life of Abraham, you will see his faith grow. God didn't immediately test his faith, as he did later, many years later. But here, it was enough that he said, go, and I'll show you later where you're going, and his faith was strong enough that caused him to leave. So he promised to be with him. He promises to bless him, and he promises to direct him. Of course, this great promise, and it is a great promise, was a tremendous factor 
in the very life of Abraham and in the work of Abraham. I was thinking as J.D. was speaking on Christ being a servant, going through Mark, we have here in Abraham as great a servant of God as you can find. But he lived in the patriarchal age, the father rule period. He is a patriarch. There was no written law of God. They fundamentally lived according to moral laws, sin to lie, to cheat, to steal, so on, murder. But none of that's been written down. There is no certain people out of all other peoples on earth that are selected as the children of Israel would be much later on. So all men approach God if they believed in him through the patriarch, through the heads of the families, the fathers. And Abraham, of course, would demonstrate his great service mentality. And that's what I was thinking about because he was faithful. And you see this as you go through the life of Abraham. So Abraham believed God. And therefore, he lived a great and wonderful life of faithful service to God. Now, at this particular time, I want us to look into the life of Abraham and see at least some of the great lessons that come down to us and help us better as Christians live as the New Testament teaches Christians to live. Also, you will see that these principles that are found therein are for the person who's not a Christian. It shows him what he or she must be when it comes to what real faith that saves does and is. The life of Abraham, when you look through the whole of it here in Genesis, naturally divides itself into five five distinct periods. And each of these periods are clearly marked by divine revelation. In other words, each period begins with God dealing with him. And the first period we find uh, mentioned in the New Testament in Stephen's sermon, Acts 7, two through five, Acts chapter seven, two through five. But then here in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 11, Genesis 11, verses 27 through 32. Now, you see God appeared to Abram while he dwelt in Mesopotamia. I've already mentioned that, but he appears to instruct him. What is it that you're going to a land that I'm going to show you? Abram, his wife, Sarai at this time, his father, Tira, and his nephew, Lot, journey north and somewhat west, and they come to Aaron. Now, we're not told just how long they stayed in this area. But uh, if you read through and the things that were going on and how it is, it seems he stayed a good while in this area. It was here that his father died. His father was 205 years old when he died. I think it's important to emphasize here that he was told back in Ur of the Chaldees that you leave all your family. Now, I want you to notice as you go through, and I'll not try to read it all here. You can read it. But you'll notice that he does not start to perform the promises we think of him as having, as God having promised until Tira's dead and Lot has left him. Because when he has Tira with him and Lot with him, he hasn't left all his family. But they do journey on up to Iran, and that's where his father dies. Later on, we'll see something about Lot. Now, it's at uh, Haran where he evidently grows into a very wealthy person for their day and time. It tells about how he had many sheep and oxen and 
uh, he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels, all of them. Well, to a nomadic people of that time, that was a was tremendous wealth. And we'll see more about that later. What we do need to nail down here is realize that when Abraham starts up from Ur of the Chaldees and goes up to Haran, he's following the trade route. There's no telling how many people went that way. Now, he's going to come back down into northern Canaan and eventually even going down to Egypt and come back after a while. We'll miss that later. But this is a normal travel route. They didn't come straight across from Ur of the Chaldees over to Canaan because you'd have the Arabian Desert there, and they just didn't do that. They followed the waterways. I don't know what all went on that allowed him to amass such a great wealth for his day and time, but he did. It all ties in, I'm quite sure, with God saying, I'm going to bless you, and he did. It also teaches us that people can earn honest living and get quite wealthy with it, and he did so. No, inter no indication at all of that he obtained his wealth in some sort of uh, wicked, sinful way. And then when we see, I might mention this here, we'll mention it maybe again, but you'll remember when there was trouble between his herdsmen and the nephew Lot's herdsmen because their flocks were so big they were running over one another. It was Abraham who showed the humble spirit and said, Lot, you choose which way you want to go. I'll choose what's left. That says something about Abraham. So he obtains great wealth. Well, that's the first period we want to talk about. We got him to this point. The second period is in Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. It was here while he's in Haran that God again appears to him. I said each one of these five periods would be marked by God appearing to him. And he made with Abram the great covenant that is recorded by Moses in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now, Abram and those with him went then down into what we know as the land of Canaan. Verse 7 of Genesis 12 reads, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Again, this shows you that the kind of worship engaged in by the patriarchs was simply a sacrificial offering of animals on altars they built. The rest of their life was governed by basically moral law, belief in God and receiving revelations from God. Or it ties back into Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God who at sundry times in diverse manners spake in time past to the fathers by the prophets. And that's uh, one of the ways he did, different ways in which he appeared. Now, there was a great famine in the land, and that gets to be a problem. We know how hot and dry it's been here, still is. But imagine if all of us depended on flocks and herds, which means we depended on water, water and stream, and depend on grass for those animals to eat. Well, you see what a problem immediately begins to develop when you have a famine. So they go south, and they're going down into Egypt when they go south. Egypt was, of course, a long-standing empire itself, and because of the Nile River, it had so much uh, in the way of, of uh, grain and so forth raised. It was a place we know later on when Joseph got down there, and they were able through his being there and God's providence to be able to save his own people. We're not told just how long Abram stayed in Egypt. I think in view of what's just said, we can probably say not that long, but it's all relative when it comes to length of time. We just can't say. 
But after he leaves Egypt, he returns again to Canaan. Well, it gets rather interesting when he gets back to Canaan. This is where Lot's herdsmen strove with Abraham's herdsmen because of lack of pasture. And they had the separation. I already mentioned how Abram told Lot, let's, you know, we be brethren. Let's not allow this to cause a problem. So you choose the way you want to go, and I'll take what's left. And, of course, Lot dwelt in the plain of Jordan. And in so doing, he pitched his tent toward Sodom. But now Abram here goes down to Hebron. Nowadays known as Hebron. And then he said, Abram, this, this is the land. For all the land which you see, here's what God said. Abram, this is the land. Whatever you see is going to be given to your descendants, your seed, forever. So again, he renews that promise. I want to emphasize one thing that I didn't in the first three verses of Genesis 12. There are two promises he'll make of him a great nation. And that'll we'll say more about that later. But then also he will say through thy seed singular, all nations of the earth will be blessed. Which promise is more important? Well, it's actually the promise that through thy seed singular, all nations will be blessed. But in the process of getting that seed, of course, we know Jesus in the world. It's going to take a development of a people. This is one of the things that needs to be kept in mind when it comes to the unfolding of the scheme of redemption on earth. That God did it in actual historical time. It's not uh, something that is fantastic or whatever. You can actually mark it by the history and by the geography. Well, when we're getting back over into Canaan, after Lot has left, you have a fellow by the name of Chedorlaomer, who's king of Elam, and kings that were allied with him. And they made war uh, against uh, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And when they did so, they took captive all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, which meant they also took Lot, for he was living in Sodom and took his, his goods. I don't know who, and the Bible doesn't say, but somebody escaped to inform. The scripture says, Abram, the Hebrew, say something about that in a minute, about what had happened. Sometimes we'll talk about Abraham, and we think of uh, the Jews. Well, the idea of the word Jew won't exist for many, 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 many years later. Um, uh, there is no Israelite. Uh, that had to be Jacob, and his name changed to Israel. And that's a grandson of Abraham. They wouldn't turn to Israelites much later. So they are ethnic Hebrews. Now, to see something of how great Abram was, when Abram learns of all of this about Lot being taken, out of his own, what he called, what the Bible calls his own house, he has 318 armed and trained servants, and they went to war. Now, let's pause here and think about that for a minute. We would probably, if we came across a group of people like this today in some far country, we would probably call them a tribe, and Abraham a chief. Now, that's the way that things developed as people moved and populated the world. And this is what's happened here. But I think it's very interesting that Abram didn't hesitate to take these hired servants. They were trained and capable of going up against the soldiers that had taken these other places. And so he went up and soundly defeated the forces of Cheddar Labor and brought back everything 
that he had taken. And of course, that involved a lot in his possessions, his family. Now, it's on Abraham's return from, as the scripture says, the slaughter of Chedorlaomer, that Abram met Melchizedek. You heard about that a moment ago, king of Salem. Salem is where Jerusalem is. Uh, Jerusalem is a compound word meaning peace of God. Salem here is peace. You hear of the Jew today say shalom, it means peace. Uh, so he's king of Salem. But he's a priest, priest of the most high God. Now, that's interesting, because remember, this is the patriarchal age. Don't think about the Jewish nation as a nation selected out of all other nations to do what we know the Old Testament tells us they did, what we learned in the New Testament. We've got to realize that all men on earth who want to believe and serve God are doing it this way. Thus, we come across Melchizedek. And he blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And to this Melchizedek, Abram paid tithes. Now, if you want to see that developed, you may remember when Ken was teaching Hebrews. Uh, you go to Hebrews 7. If you want to write that down, just go to Hebrews 7 and see how inspiration used Melchizedek and what he had to say to the people to whom Hebrews is written. But you can also um, see something about the development of, uh, of the scheme of redemption and how Paul, by inspiration, employs it in uh, Genesis uh, chapter 3, or rather chapter 2, where he talks about some of this. The point being here is that the Judaizing teacher of the first century, who said, yes, you Gentiles can be saved. Jesus is the Messiah. You must obey him, but you must be circumcised to keep the law. Paul points out what is very obvious right here that I've emphasized throughout the where we've been going here, and that is Abraham wasn't a Jew. Abraham never was other law of Moses. Abraham was one who was faithful to God, even as Melchizedek. Thus, there is no connection between the Judaizing teacher, who I assure you loved to appeal to Abraham. I'm a child of Abraham. And uh, that was what they, and the unbelieving Jews as well, the unbelieving Jews certainly, that's where they put their hope and their stock as far as being a descendant of Abraham. You see that in, in the matter of uh, Nicodemus. He had no idea of a spiritual birth. He was born a descendant of Abraham through Jacob, and that was sufficient for him. And you'll remember that in John the Baptist, preparing the Jews for to, re to receive uh, the Christ and his work, uh, John denounced them rather strongly and called them, uh, what they were, and said, don't say to yourself, we have Abraham, our father. Well, God can of these stones raise up children to Abraham. J.D. pointed out that Mark is all about power, and that impressed the Romans. Now think about that for a minute. God can of these stones raise up children to Abraham. He can take the genetic code that makes that thing a stone and rearrange it to make a descendant of Abraham. There's a lot in some of those statements you have to think about, realize. That's what, that basically is what was being said. God can take that genetic code that as it is now makes it a stone, and he can redo it and make it a descendant of Abraham, make one of you out of it. And that's, I think, rather interesting. Well, we come now to the third period. And this is in Genesis 15 and 16. So God appears to Abram. And when he does so, he explains something else to him. That his heir was not to be Abraham's servant, Eliezer. That his heir would be a son of his own body. God said, then you, you look to the heaven and look at the stars in the heaven. And um, if you'd be able to number them, which of course he couldn't, 
And he said, so your, shall your seed be as the stars of heaven, Genesis 15, 5. Scripture says that Abraham believed God and it was reckoned unto him for righteousness. There's a whole study here because this is employed by Paul in teaching about how the gospel system, the New Testament system of salvation, the Christian system, is a system of faith. Involves laws, all the perfect law of liberty, James 125, but it's a system of faith to serve it. And if you want to see how that works, just look at Abraham. Abraham at times did some things that left to himself didn't turn out too well. But anytime God told him to do something, he did it just exactly like God told him to do it. Thus, he's a father of the faithful. It didn't mean he was flawless and every little thing on earth. But it meant that when God said, I want you to do this, he did it. Thus, it was reckoned unto him for righteousness. God said, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees, give thee this land to inherit it. God explained to Abram that his descendants would be in bondage in what he calls a strange land, and that they would come out of that land in the fourth generation that time they would return to Canaan. Let me pause here and say this. If we don't watch out, and if we're good Bible students, and we've studied this stuff, we will remember all the stuff that was done later on in the formation of Israel down in captivity in Egypt and all that was involved in coming out in the wilderness wanderings and going over possessing the land of Canaan and all the years they were in it and their apostasy, and the prophets that were sent. And then we'll remember all the things that we have in the New Testament. Well, Abraham didn't know a whole lot of that stuff. Got to keep that in mind. And you might try as an experiment, and just sometimes right now, what did Abraham really understand about all God's telling him? It's certainly not what we have, because we have a whole lot more than Abraham ever had. Now, he had been in this land of Canaan, the best we could figure out, a few years, maybe 10 years. But he didn't have any children. And it was Sarai who suggested to Abram that he have a child by her handmaiden, who was Hagar. She was an Egyptian handmaid. I don't know what all she was thinking. I, I put the best spin on it. Let's say that she, knowing their ages, not knowing all that we know, but knowing the basic of the promise, she thought she'd help the thing out. She was concerned about the covenant. She was concerned about what was going to happen. So she did what she did. And we're going to have to stop here because our time's up. But Ishmael was born. And this is a good place for us to stop because we can develop this next, next time around, the Lord willing. But just remember, he is being very faithful to God on the basis of what he knew God said. And he did not know what we know. So let's keep that in mind. We'll pause here. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Our Father in heaven, we're thankful we could be together this evening. Thankful we could study about this grand patriarch. Pray that we'll learn lessons from it that will help us better understand the scheme of redemption that brought us down to Christ and the church. Help us, Father, to go through our days faithful to thee and see the great faithfulness of Abraham and his obedience. May that help us to be obedient to the gospel in all ways. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.